way with this, uh, this, uh, sir, uh, this uh, lesson and that you will get the glory for yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say amen. 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 So sir. we want to thank everybody for joining for this hybrid version of our church school. February was the 19th, 2023. And so our last week we talked about God's holy calling and we left a lot of meat on the bone from last week's lesson. But there's one particular question I asked you all to think about during the week. So I know you all thought about it and remembered it because you thought I would forget, but no, no, no. And so I want to just lift this out here real quickly and we can move on to today's lesson. Uh, so last week they asked the question, how could Timothy safeguard this priceless treasure? And the priceless treasure Paul was referring to, the writer was referring to, is the Holy Spirit that was within Timothy and the faith that Timothy had placed to him through his mother, his grandmother. And so as you all thought about that, how, how, would you, how do you safeguard what God has placed in you? How, how are some of the ways you would safeguard that? I wrote down um, by reading and study the Bible more. Amen. Amen. Anybody else got something different? I had the same thing, but I also had remembering where you came from and thinking about where you might be going. Amen. That's good, too. That's good, too. Anybody got anything different before we move on? No wrong answers. No wrong answers. All right, so so when I thought about that question, I, I, this is what I thought of. I said, uh, by keeping himself free of idol worship. And so if we think about it in terms of the lessons that have been going on, that was one of the major things that, that the people were dealing with in Israel. Here we are in the New Testament, and they're in this place, and Paul is telling Timothy to preach the, the word in season, out of season to uh, remember the faith, don't be scared, be bold. And, um, and so to keeping himself free of the idol worship, keep himself free of false teachings and environments that didn't honor God. And so, so all those things that we talked about can be those things that will help protect us, uh, for help, not protect, help keep that which God has sealed us with, which is the Holy Spirit of promise and the gifts that God put, put us in and so on over the week, I mean, and as we're talking about, we're talking about something, but we got back to, and I, and I said to her, I said, one of the things we had to learn as believers, we want to, you know, we got some people who are just super spiritual and everything, you can't do nothing. You know, every, you know, they talk about Rihanna, oh, it was devil worship. You know, they talk about all these other things and, and, and they don't realize oftentimes that God told us not to be, not to be, he told us we got to be in the world, but not of the world. Oh, so, right. so we can't separate ourselves from everything. You know, if, that, if that's the case, we would just live in our homes or wherever we are and never interact with other people. You know, you know those, y'all you, know some of them holy folks, them super holy folks. If you breathe wrong, that's a sin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can't be around the folks, they breathe wrong. They, they just sinful. God said, separate yourself. No, he said, don't let them infuse their stuff on you. So don't get caught up in that, you know, like Paul was trying to tell Timothy, don't get caught up in that type of idol worship. Don't get up caught up in the things that don't honor God. And that becomes a, a, a main part of who you are and your character. All right, so let's, let's uh, move on. I just want to thank you all for, for remembering to think about that over the week. I pray that uh, something else uh, popped up in your spirit to help you realize that in this walk to get closer to God, there are some things that are required of us and some things that we should do to help protect us from those influences and those things that would, would help push us towards not doing what God would have us to do. All right, so this week's lesson, God chooses the poor. God chooses the poor. Uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, our key verse, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised 
to those who love him. That's James chapter two, verse five. All right, we don't have anybody who showed up in the sanctuary as of yet. So I wanna uh, ask somebody uh, online, could you read uh, our text for this morning? Uh, James two, verses one through 12, please. Okay, I'll get it. Um, I have to read your screen and I left my book downstairs. So All right. I'll have to follow along and then I'm gonna go get my book. My brothers and sisters, to you with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the other who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made a distinctions among yourselves and become judges with the evil thoughts? Listen, my behold, beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you? Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellence name that, uh, that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You should love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery and said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Amen. Thank you, Sister Michelle. So that's our reading for this morning. All right. So some key terms. Uh, James is a, a derivative of Jacob, uh, which means supplanter, uh, favoritism. Uh, in the Greek, it's diacrino, 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 and it may make judgments uh, to categorize people based on their class. Uh, dishonored is one of our terms, and in the Greek, it is pronounced atomazo, atomazo, atomazo. And it uh, means to despise, to treat with contempt, contempt, to treat with contempt. And our last Greek term is oppress. In the Greek, it is kata denestero, kata denestero, kata denestero. And it, and it means exercise harsh control by using power over others or against others. So the writer starts off this way uh, this week. They said, James, leader of the Jerusalem church and Jesus's brother, true to his name, describes Christian conduct that supersedes or replaces societal norms. In today's lesson, James emphasizes the importance of loving everyone, particularly does not, uh, partiality does not advance God's loving kingdom. For James to give this instruction must indicate that the churches were favoring the rich over the poor. James reminds them that God makes poor people rich. How? In faith and in their promised inheritance of the kingdom. All right, so James is, is talking to the church. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the church of um, uh, 
Philippi, I believe it is, because you have Philippians, and then I believe James is also talking to the church of Philippi. I, I need to check that. But so James is writing his letter to the church, and, and James is noticing something within the church that the church uh, or believers who are following the way are giving those who they see as important special privileges, special rights, you know, that they're treating those who are, are deemed significant, those who are deemed rich, uh, better than those who are not, those who are poor, uh, those who, who are distressed. And, and so James is warning them that this is not so, that, that this is not to be among us in the body of Christ, in the body of believers, of, in the body of the people of the way, and that we are to, to have an a equality or we ought to have a, a treatment that's not disparative among those who are coming within our ranks, uh, those who may not believe, even with those who believe. Uh, we're going to get farther in that, but we see it. We, we, we witness it. We, we, we've probably done it. <laughs> uh, those of us who might be ushers, uh, those of us who might be leaders in the church. We, so I don't want to go too far. We're going to talk about it some more. All right, and, and so that's what we see uh, James warning the church about. Be on guard about how you treat people. Be on guard that you don't, that you treat everyone fairly. Be on guard that you don't get this sense of, um, of entitlement for those who you feel should be entitled. And so James is warning us. And so, and so telling the Bible story, uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Christians who believe in Jesus should not treat people based upon perceptions. I could start right there. We probably have a, a discussion on that particular sentence for the rest of the class. <laughs> Christians who believe in Jesus should not treat people based upon perceptions. Rich people may receive a great amount of respect and deference based upon clothes, jewelry, or looks, people are judged, human nature. A person with finery was to be treated the same as a person in ragged clothes. Both should receive the same attention to afford the rich person a seat and have the poor person stand in a remote place did not display faith in Jesus. Jesus admonished the Pharisees for taking seats of honor and against wealth discrimination. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> when you are invited to a wedding feast, do not, sit in, do not sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table, Luke chapter 14, verses eight through 10. Bias based on perceived wealth often strings attach, often has strings attached. Personal gain, uh, James labels uh, this desire to benefit from relationships uh, with the wealthy as an evil motive, as an evil motive. And so the writer uh, digs further into our text and he talks about um, how we as Christians who believe in Jesus should not treat people based upon perceptions. But we don't ever do that, do we? <laughs> Cause y'all such good Bible believing, spirit feel, Holy Ghost, obedient believers, you never treat people based upon perceptions. You may thank it, but you don't treat it. Now, let me start. <laughs> and so we, I mean, we honest this morning, everybody who hear my voice, we've all been in that, that spot that we've looked at somebody and we made a prejudgment about who, about what we think they are and what we think who they are. And we place them in a particular category because of our preconceived uh, prejudice or our preconceived perception of what we saw. And so, and so James is warning us, if we believe in Jesus, we shouldn't treat folks like that. 
and, and think about that. Think about that. Um, so let me ask this question. Why, why would you think, or what, what would you say about that statement? Why should people who believe in Jesus treat people based upon perception? A certain way or not a certain way? Like you said, well, they shouldn't, but that's just the way it's always been. That's the way society has us to do things. And my, you know. All right, all right. Anybody else? I think because if we're truly following the way as they were supposed to follow the way, and they lived. Um, you know, along the same time as Jesus. So they saw these social constructs, but Jesus just annihilated all of them. He socialized with women and that wasn't supposed to be. He empowered women and that wasn't supposed to be at their time. He spoke to blind Bartimaeus when others in the crowd told him to be quiet. So Jesus totally treated everyone the same. And if we're going to follow the ways of Jesus, then we should as well. We struggle because we're human. He didn't because he was also divine. All right, so, so uh, Dr. Fun, um, I, I, can't think of I was gonna call you Funderburg. I know that's not right. <laughs> uh, well, I'm drawing a blank on your name. Help me, help me, help me. So Doc, she's in the she's in the congregation. Well, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Uh, so so Sister Ines. Dr. Said, Plummer. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Plummer. Dr. Plummer, thank you, Sister Michelle. It was gonna come to me about halfway through the lesson. I I yell out, Dr. Plummer. Y'all be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so Sister Ines said that um that we should treat everyone that that one of the reasons why we shouldn't treat people based upon their possession as Christians. Is because Jesus destroyed those social constructs. Basically, that Jesus was our example on how we should treat people. That Jesus spoke to women, which was not really part of the social construct of, the, of his time. That Jesus empowered women, which is not part of Jesus spoke to the blind folks, people who were infirm, which was not part of the social construct of the time. And so, and so because we are followers of the way as they were. And Jesus was their examples that they saw with their eyes that we should follow the example of Jesus. And, and that's kind of what I was getting at when I asked the question. Because when we read scripture and we think about scripture, especially when we transition over to the New Testament and we talk about the covenant of grace and, and Jesus. And, and so Jesus did incorporate everybody. If you remember, the religious leaders got upset because Jesus was eating with the tax collector. They got upset because Jesus was eating with the prostitute and talking to the prostitute. You know, you're supposed to be the man of God. How are you going to be with the tax collector? Go ahead, Dr. Plummer. Yeah, and so Dr. Plummer brought up Matthew 5, which is part of my notes later in the lesson. They, they forgot about the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, when he preached about the Beatitude. Blessed are the poor. For they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so, and so it's so, and she said, because we're human, that we often find ourselves struggling with that. But because God was, Jesus was divine and perfect, he understood how to incorporate and love everybody. All right. And so, and so a couple of questions that the, the, the writer asked about this particular section. He says, uh, how can you tell who is wealthy and who is poor? You can't, unless they're a movie star, actor, mm -hmm. the, somebody you know is making money. And you know, the uh, one time they talked about, um, well, several times you hear them talk about people who um, live like a ragged life or don't have anything. And uh, when they die, they find they have these big bank accounts and um, money everywhere. So you really can't tell, I don't think. 
Yes, ma'am. And so, and so Sister Val said, you really can't tell unless they like a movie star actor. And I want to push back just a little bit. Even in that, you don't really know what people have. You think about all these stories you hear about these actors and movie stars, sports, rich folks who we think have a lot of money and we find out that they owe the IRS millions of dollars the day in the hole. You think about the last person who was supposed to be the president of the United States who claimed he had all his money, all his money, but he didn't. He didn't have the wealth that he that he said he had. And so, and so, yes, th there's uh, no real way to tell, and and we can make judgments and assumptions, but we really don't know a person's wealth unless they want to share it with us. Because because uh, Sister Val said that we look at some folks who look poor, who might not look like they have wealth. But they got millions, almost billions in the bank. If you look at somebody like, um, if you think about Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett is, is a multimillionaire, probably a billionaire. But Warren Buffett still lives in the same house that he grew up in. He don't have no mega mansion. Matter of fact, I think he drives like a, a 87 Cadillac Brome or something like that. You know, and so if you saw Warren Buffett, you would think he probably some middle class person just like you who live in the community you live in. You wouldn't you wouldn't think that Warren Buffett was this mega million billionaire just by appearance or unless you actually knew who Warren Buffett was. Most of us probably would pass Warren Buffett on the street and had no idea that it's Warren Buffett. And so but then there are others who don't have what Warren Buffett have and got maybe a couple million and they live like they're billionaires. And so we can't be caught up in appearance. We can't be caught up in this, in this thing that we have put in our minds, the culture has put in our mind, this is what rich people look like, and this is what poor people look like. Yeah, we had a, um, a gentleman <coughs> at our job one time um, that worked in capital facilities, meaning just, you know, they would say, the janitor or whatever you want to say or however you want to call him. <clears throat> and it was so that um, dispersing or yeah, HR dispersing had to contact him because he had too much money in his 401 that would outdo whatever he was supposed to. It was over a million dollars or getting close to it. So they had to change his funds and his records because of what he had. But if you look at him coming in a regular uniform every single day, just doing his regular work and everything else, you would never know that he had all that money sitting up there and saved and waiting. They had to change his account because he had too much money. And so Michelle's saying about a gentleman at her job who was janitorial service, however you want to categorize it that he had saved so much money in his 401k that the company had to change how they invest, how they would invest in this 401k, that he was sitting on millions of dollars. He said, if you looked at him coming to work every day, you would never think that he was sitting on all his money as he, I guess, probably pushing his broom, rolling the can around, dumping the trash, sweeping, mopping, whatever he doing to help keep the facilities up but he was frugal enough and saved enough that now he's in a millionaire status. But the perception that we have, not on even how people look, but what people work. <laughs> uh, they, they, they're truck driver. They can't be making a lot of money. I bet they, you know, and, and so we have all these preconceived notions about who, what people are, and who people are. And so the second question he asked, in what ways does favoritism show up in our churches? We should be popping up like popcorn. I know y'all, unless y'all scared to talk about it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Reverend Williams, um, when I first came to turn out, you know, I didn't know anybody, but just my relatives, my Uncle Joe. And um, on, the people only knew me by uh, Joe Stanley's niece. And it was like, I felt like, you know, they did not welcome me as a member and anything, I didn't get participate in anything when I finally volunteered to do help with something. I was never contacted or you know, like that. So I was sort of like in a corner with just the people who I was sitting with um, and I would come to church that I made friends with until um, 
my uncle told Miss Preston I wanted to sing on the on, on Celeste Corral. And when I joined, she told me to come to rehearsal. When I joined the choir, everybody reached out to me. So you so you mean being Joe Stanley's niece didn't get you no no special privileges when you came to Georgia? All they knew me by was Joe Stanley's niece. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Val says she, you know, when she came here, they, they only knew her by Joe Stanley's niece, but she didn't really have people felt like people reached out and embraced her. And so she she didn't see a, 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 a sense of favoritism until she joined the choir. Then she felt, uh, Dr. Plummer, go ahead. Uh -huh. And so Dr. Plummer says sometimes favoritism shows up in family connections. When you join the church and they know that your family here, that you get special treatment, especially your family. Cause, yeah, that, she said like that's so-and-so's grandchild. And, and, yeah. And so being a minister, which I, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny that when, when people know, cause I ain't wanting to go and brag, you know, tell people, you know, blah, I'm, I'm just there. I'm just there. Well, I sure I'm just there. And so they somebody might say to somebody, well, you know, that's Reverend Williams. And they're like, oh, Reverend, I, I didn't know you was a Reverend. You can come up here. And I'm thinking, well, I'm good by here. I mean, nobody, nobody wanted to make a fuss when they thought I was just some dude walking in the room. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I got some title, you, you don't have to make special concessions for me. And, and so we do that in the church. You know, and 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 so. Let me say this, put a caveat here. And so there are uh, occasions and there are instances where we want to honor those who have been placed in positions of authority and nothing wrong with that. Uh, how do I say this? So nothing's wrong with honoring those folks, nothing at all. But when we start giving them uh, treatment that's beyond what everybody else can have and embrace, we might need to think about that. Uh, example, so, now I don't wanna out nobody, I'm not gonna tell that story. But, but sometimes people will, I have, let me say it this way. I have had people approach me about things that we should do in the church. And the assumption was I didn't do it because I'm a minister. And they said, you know, you got to do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, why would you think I've done that? I don't see you on the list. Then I had to, here it is right here. I did it. I, my, I took a screenshot of it so we wouldn't be, had no confusion. And so for me, myself, I don't, I don't, ah, thank you, Holy Spirit. This is what favoritism does a lot of times for, the, for those of us who receive it on a regular basis. It, it uh, help me, Holy Spirit, to say this. It it um it validates us to operate outside of the rules. <laughs> cause cause rules don't apply to me. Cause you know I, I'm Reverend Williams. I, I ain't gotta do what all the rest of the congregants do. Cause I, I got a little special treatment. I've been favored. You know I'm a minister to faith development. So you know. I ain't got to fill out the protocols for, for the screening for COVID. You know, I'm on staff, I'm here every Sunday. Why do I need to fill that out? Because there's some time during the week, I end up testing positive. If it's just a nice tracing to let you all know that you were in my presence <laughs> and you might want to check yourself out. But you know, and so so when we be, when we operate in this in this spirit of favoritism and we don't treat everybody as saints, those of us who receive it often feel validated to operate outside of the rules. All right, let me move on. All right, so um, I don't even know where I put my note. Let me share my notes. I said we treat, uh, the second question, we treat people we think that are important with privileges. So that's, that's the way uh, favoritism shows up in our churches a lot of times. All right. James 2, uh, verses 5 to 7. Unfortunately, people sometimes think that rich people will offer a material benefit. What they fail to grasp is that better benefit lies with what God promises the poor. 
Richness and faith offers immeasurable advantages such as love, peace, joy, protection, progeny, our wisdom. But favoring the rich results in people missing these, missing these blessings. Ironically, uh, preference for the rich for rich people empowers the wealthy to treat very, uh, very, to treat very people show, to treat the very people showing them favor favor harshly. Let me read that again. Ironically, preference for rich people empowers the wealthy to treat the very people showing them favor harshly. If only believers could see that insulting the poor is an affront to God. Displaying favoritism belittles others and casts disparagement on the body of Christ. Christians are often judged by who they say they are and how they treat others. Y'all heard it. I can't believe they supposed to be a Christian. They talk about they go to church every Sunday. They the nastiest person in the office. I can't stand dealing with that dude. He just so nasty. He supposed to be a reverend. He told me he a reverend. You hear some of the stuff he talk about at the lunch table? And, <laughs> and so we get these criticisms and it's not oftentimes just because we're Christian. Well, let me rephrase that. We get these criticisms because we say we're Christian, and then we display this what, what others would say unchristian like behavior. And, and, and then we begin to, to, to start operating in these, these negative norms, negative norms. I'm gonna have to trade my dad. These negative norms that we see in culture. That, that we, we criticize people who are poor. We, we look side-eyed at them or those who we think that are poor. You know, we, we, we don't treat them in a way that we treat folks who we think that are like us. And so I, I remember when I used to work downtown when I was a, a copy service tech. And so I would be all over the city fixing, fixing copy, copies and Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, wherever there was a service call and we would pass people on the street. I would pass people on the street regularly, the home, the unhoused, uh, those who, who need to be fed or whatever. And, and they would ask people for, for money or whatever they were asking people for. And to see the inhumanity that people had towards people, you know, even if you didn't have nothing to give them, people would not even acknowledge them. And so I made a, a, a conscious effort for me that even if I didn't have nothing to give them, that I would at least say, man, or sis, I don't have nothing right now. I wish I had something to give you, but you know, you have a good day. You had the best, you know, something that, that I, I can't help you in your situation right now, but I recognize your humanity. And when we begin to show favoritism, and we begin to judge people for what we think they have, and we show this discontent before those who we think are poor. We, we, especially as believers, we go against what God called us to be or God called us to do. And, and I think about uh, Paul and uh, Paul when they were walking past the, the gate, beautiful, and the gentleman was there. He was begging. And they told him, silver and gold have we none, but such I give to you, you know, such I give unto you is the power of God and, and the love of Christ. And, and, and so sometimes that's all we have to give, but that's the best thing we can give. <laughs> you know, you might not have the financial wherewithal to, to, to give or so, but give them an encouraging word. You know, get, get, give them a, a morsel of faith, something they could grab onto. And, and, so, and so James talks about uh, insulting the poor is an affront to God. Really, James? How, how'd you come to that conclusion, James? And we talked about it uh, earlier uh, when, when Dr. Plummer brought it up, and she talked about the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it. And Jesus talked about the poor shall inherit the kingdom. Blessed, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And, and we think about the life and the ministry of Jesus. 
Jesus did not hang out in too many affluent places. Jesus was often with those whose society had denigrated, whose society had no, no love for, whose society uh, thought were not of value. And Jesus was with those persons, as, as Sister Inez said earlier, he was destroying the cultural norm. Jesus was showing us a new way. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Plummer said Jesus was teaching us, not even just not only showing us a new way, but he was teaching us a new way, how we should value everybody. She brought up some examples of persons who did that, Mother Teresa, Jimmy Carter. And so those people who are, were humanitarians, they saw everybody as valuable. And we live in a society now that don't always see everybody as valuable. And so as believers, we need to shift our mindset or, or make a conscious effort if we already don't, that we see everybody as valuable. And, and, and I don't know how we cannot do that when we look at scripture, we, we apply the scripture. We look, and when we look at John, you know, the, the cardboard that hold up all the sporting event, John 316. And we know what that is by, by, by heart for God so loved the world. No, God so loved rich people. God so loved heterosexuals. God so loved people who don't sin. <laughs> no, none of that was there. He said, God so loved the world that he gave. So he died for all. God valued all through the gift of his son, Jesus. And so, so how can we, in turn, call Jesus our father, with God our father, Jesus our brother, and our savior, and then not live like he lived and value people? Value all people. We value folks who got money, because in turn, we think maybe we can get something out of that. <coughs> Poor person like, well, you know, they ain't got nothing for me. They look at them, they out on the street, they. I mean, and so, and so, so this lesson really challenges us to change our lens if we haven't already to see everybody as a person of value. All right, anybody else got anything they wanna add? All right, James 2, uh, I said that like I'm from Baltimore, T U. Uh, James 2, uh, verses eight through 12. <laughs> Jesus said the most important commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. If you love your neighbor as yourself, all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. James indicates that impartiality demonstrates love and action. Impartiality demonstrates love and action while showing partiality uh, is sinful. I'm gonna skip around because we should be ending up soon. All right, James lets them know that partiality is equivalent to breaking all the commandments, including murder and adultery. Christians ought to recognize the freedom obtained in Jesus's death, burial and resurrection and extend that same free love to others that love never condemns or judges. Love never condemns or judges. I like what, what the writer says when he says, James indicates that impartiality demonstrates love and action. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus calls us to love and agape. Jesus calls us to love like him, unconditional. We will put some parameters on our love. <laughs> well, if you do this for me, you treat me like this, I'm going to treat you well. But if you don't do that, I ain't got nothing for you. I don't care nothing about you. <laughs> and so, And Jesus says, no, 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 no. There's no impartiality in this thing. We need, I need you to love everybody the same way I loved you. Go ahead, Dr. Plummer. What about this one? I got mine. Well, you go get yours. 
And Dr. Plummer said the, 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 the saying we've all said, I got mine, you go get yours. <laughs> oh, what a demonstration of love. <laughs> what about I got mine, let me help you get yours. Let me show you how you might be able to get yours. Or, may, or maybe if I'm, if I'm well off enough, let me give you what I got so you can get yours. And, and, so, and so this notion of love is something that we all should be driven by, something that we all should operate in. And, so, and love will challenge, true love, agape love will challenge you to your core. Because <laughs> there are going to be some people who would challenge everything in you <laughs> that would make you not want to love them, would, my, would make you not want to treat them with some respect or honor. And Jesus says, you know what? Yeah, they like that, but love them anyway. Think about what Jesus could have did when he encountered the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus knew who she was. Jesus knew her story. Jesus knew all that before they got in the conversation. And they, he began to talk to the sister. And the sister's like, well, you know, I'm just at this well. I'm trying to get water. And, you know, it's the middle of the day. And she's like, well, you shouldn't be in the middle of the day. You know, that's, cult that's not against, that's against the cultural norm. And she said, well, you shouldn't be talking to me because I'm a Samaritan and you a Jew. And Jesus said, okay, but, uh, you know, what's, what's the importance of this well? Well, this is my, my people's well. You know, we dug this well. And then she switches that conversation to worship. And y'all know the story. And Jesus began to tell her about her life and says, you know, uh, you got all these husbands and the man you with now is not your husband. And, and Jesus interacted with this sister, not from a point of condemning her, but showing that even though culturally I should not be uh, uh, communicating with you, I should not be in the setting with you, but that I see you. I see that you have value. And I want to know, even with all that stuff you did, that you're still valuable, you're still important. Go let somebody know. <laughs> and, and the sister went off and she told everybody, come see a man that told me everything about me. And, and prayerfully, when people interact with us, that could be their takeaway and their testimony. Man, I need y'all come see this sister. She, she ministered to me. Come see this brother. He, he told me about the love of God. I was in a place that, that I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel important. I didn't, I didn't feel seen. And the love of God says, I got you. I see you. And so let's try to be that in the church. When the person walks in and don't look like they are part of us, and y'all know what I'm talking about, and just their appearance looks like they might be on the streets or they might be in a bad spot. It ain't our time to look at them side eye. It ain't our time to hold our nose and say, oh my God, they need a bath. They need to comb their hair. They need to go to the hairdresser. That, it ain't time for that. It's time for us then to show the love of God. Brother, sister, how you doing? I'm so glad you came to join us. Is that, what's your name? What, what, what's going on with you? Get, get something I can help you with, you know, in, in a way that's not offensive to them or show that, you know, try to say that we treat them as less than. And so it's a delicate balance. All right, we, we gotta go. Let me hear it go. All right. But, but um, when I was a child, I thought like a child, but when I became a man, when I became a full grown person, I put away childish things. And so love calls us to be unconditional in how we see one another. It'll challenge us, but it calls us to do that. All right, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us and that you would show us how to honor one another how to honor those within the body, and how to honor those who are outside of the body. 
that we would see value in every person because you sent your son to redeem the life of everyone that is born. And if he was, if, if, if our lives were important enough for you to send your son, the lives of those who don't know you yet are important enough for us to honor them. So teach us to love unconditionally that you may get the glory out of our lives. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we say amen. 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 Bless you.